he's not an employee of the EC or any other public sector entity. So um, Evo is the author of Essential Balances, which is a book I haven't read, but I have read his blog, which is um, a very interesting blog when it comes to the breadth and the and the insight that he has. So I would recommend that highly to you. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get started with with Evo, just a, as a sort of a general matter to get some context, Evo, on how you got started with with linked data and uh, what your background is. Yeah, thanks, Alan, for inviting me. Well, my my main interest has always been to understand how systems work. And by that, I mean three types of systems, individuals, organizations and society. And I find that they have a lot in common. And that's in that book you mentioned. But also I see the use of knowledge graphs in these three scales, personal, enterprise and global. My main focus, though, was always on organizations. And that did not change the last 25 years. On the surface, uh, my professional path can be seen um, as an IT path, just with a bit of a strange slope. I mean, normally people in IT start as developers, then they become team leaders, team leaders. at some point uh, managers, and then they make startups. For me, it was rather the opposite. I started with startups. They were in software development and business consulting. One of them I managed until it grew to over 100 people. Then I continued as an independent management consultant and enterprise architect. And I started uh, increasingly doing hands-on stuff. So what brought me to semantic technologies? Oh, well, that was my interest in modeling organizational processes and structures. I was deep into enterprise modeling when I discovered OWL and I developed my first ontology, basically I was uh, dissatisfied with the lack of rigor of other modeling approaches. Um, for me, it was strange to see that things like UML and later Archimate were away from the business, from one side uh, way too technical, but at the same time, not really executable. So how can you know that your model is right if you cannot run it? Uh, and further, what is the actual impact if the model is not used by the enterprise information system, but just to plan and document them? Then my interest shifted. It shifted into enterprise data integration, where I was puzzled uh, by the way it was normally handled. And I can say I'm still puzzled. A couple of things uh, that the folks should note in, 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 in your description of your background. Um, had a little bit of an echo here. Um, one of them is that you, you have an interest in the whole panoply of knowledge graphs. And Peter Winstanley introduced our personal knowledge graph working group to you. Because uh, you've, you've worked with uh, networked note-taking tools such as Rome, and you've posted about that. Um, you see the how how the commonality of those things, obviously. But um, can you just uh, give us a, a brief description of your interest in the personal side of things? And uh, we will be talking mostly about enterprise today, but um, yeah. it, it'd be good to just give a a quick overview. Well, my my. Personal interest, it, it, it's, it's very old actually, it's from the 90s. Um, it, was, it was triggered by the work because at that time um, I had a company that was a, a partner of IBM and we were doing uh, things with a lot of domino around knowledge management. So, so at that time there was something called IBM Knowledge Management Institute. I started following it. It triggered another interest that is still very uh, big interest for me in, in complexity and cognitive sciences. So, so I follow that. And um, at that time, I was doing also lectures in knowledge management. And at some point, uh, I started thinking of how I handle my 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 personal knowledge which increased as interest when I was doing my PhD. So how I link all these things, but not only for the period of this project, but 
uh, for the whole life. And then I found the system of Nicholas Luhmann, Settle Kasten. I was and still am a, a big fan of uh, Nicholas Luhmann. There is a whole chapter in my book devoted to that. And I found his system ingenious, the Settle Kasten. Try to imitate that first with a product called uh, ZimWiki. Then I tried with something uh, clumsier, uh, but at the same time better in terms of functionality, which was uh, the, th the thing you know very well. Evernote, until I found uh, ROM research. ROM research is still not a semantic knowledge graph, but it has the, mm, the potential to be because it, it's written in closure, you know, and the it, it works with datums, and datums is like a triple, just uh, it's a it's a it's a five tuple ve vector. So it, it's um, it has the whole potential to um, really add to what it has already, which is very strong um, explicit semantics that is currently lacking, and also persistent URIs. It has three URIs, but they're not quite persistent um, throughout graphs. But it's not about Rome itself. It's, it, it triggered a lot of um, a whole ecosystem of interesting tools like Logsec, Athens, uh, Obsidian, uh, Remnote, and, and many others that uh, sort of try to find out different ways of dealing with this problem. And I'm very happy that this is happening uh, because it triggers more innovation. For example, in the case of Rome, there are so many things happening outside Rome that are uh, important for how it develops that, um, in fact, um, it's, it's really um, a social phenomenon. It is, and, and I know you've written a lot about um, community and uh, autonomy in the context of an online environment, and, and it seems like there's a there's a the ability to harness the community in a slight in a somewhat different way than we're accustomed to and and, and you you talked about centralization and decentralization in one of your posts um any any insights as to where the the rome trend is 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 heading or what are you anticipating next that's uh Art that, that's a tough question. Um, yeah. it, um, it, it for for the for the faith of all these. I mean, if if we start with with the so um, there are certain balances uh, that's also in my book that are important for any any system, uh, individual, society, or organization, and uh, and uh, one of them is the balance between autonomy and cohesion. If we look at where it was very successful, one of such project is the World Wide Web. It is successful because the cohesion that is achieved through standards uh, like HTML and protocols like HTTP does not uh, limit, but on the contrary, it promotes the autonomy. People are autonomous to build things, to share things, and that triggers more and more innovation. It's a, it is a virtuous cycle, and actually it's a fractal fractal of virtual cycles. That's that's very important. In a way, I see this happening now with uh, personal knowledge graph systems, and what they they are currently lacking is the way they actually um, talk to each other. You can do great things in your knowledge graph, but at some point you would like to exchange things and to use certain shared parts of other knowledge graph as if they're part of your knowledge graph. And, and yeah. they're, for some reason, not yet there. I don't know why they do not reuse more from what was achieved by the semantic community. Really, none of them does so. Um, on the other side, they excel at the way they handle text, but there are a lot of things now in from the um, NLP community that they do not yet reuse. So I think the, these two um, potentials that are unleashed will, will shape the, the future of this ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you've got a nice perspective on, on uh, sort of a 
a high altitude perspective, if you will, on on what seems to be happening. Um, and often the tribes aren't talking to each other. Um, and that's again the case in in this context. Uh, let's let's switch to the enterprise and and I don't want to dominate the conversation here, but I did want to get us um, some grounding on uh, how you've worked with enterprises over the years. Um, you're 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 a really effective educator. Um, you 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 can uh, one of the problems that we've been having in our working group is you know how do we one of the one of the missions is how do we lower the barriers to entry for semantics and knowledge graphs? How do we make it easier for people to get started? Um, you are, you have taken steps to to help educate people in terms of the semantic standards. What are you seeing in enterprise in terms of adoption and and how to encourage it? Yeah. Uh, well, my. When it comes to semantics, that is related to that part of my life where I started working with um, uh, European institutions. So, um, for example, with uh, the European Commission, uh, I've been working with since 2011. Uh, it was initially a consulting work on, on business process management and enterprise architecture. So basically, uh, my first um, enterprise knowledge graph prototypes, they were under the umbrella of enterprise architecture. It was uh, it was that also that I shared as an approach called uh, SASI architecture, which stands for Semantic Architecture for Social Systems. And it was later when actually I was uh, assigned something that was labeled uh, linked data and semantic knowledge. It was around five years ago. So it, it came, it's quite recent. Um, and what what I found is um, that I first tried a top-down approach that failed basically, uh, and and then I started to do things differently. What I started to do is uh, uh, first a different kind of training. So I developed a training course. It was a two-day intensive course on linked data semantic technologies, but designed in a way that was with no prerequisites. And it was offered to all European institutions. So people came from European Commission, Parliament, Court of Justice, everywhere. Uh, and it went for several years. It's still going on once once a month. What I what I achieved there that is that. Um, over 60% of people were business people. I tried to make it accessible to them. Also, also showing that the mainstream computational paradigms, they require uh, somehow that there are the translators of the, IT, the business things to, to, to the IT. While in this paradigm, you can bring business people directly, that, that they describe their work, and, and this work is already used in, in IT systems. Uh, so that's that's a completely different way of looking at this um, this gap between business and IT that brought so many things to happen, uh, like business process management, uh, uh, service-oriented architecture, and enterprise architecture. They came in a very strange way. So if IT and business, they talk in different languages, all these bridges, they came providing a third language, which was not the right way to go, basically. A and I tried to convey this message to, to, to be, be gentle and warm to business people. Um, I don't know if you know, for example, the way I recently described Sparkle with this uh, metaphor for bu bucket, buckets and bowls, uh, because people don't want to know what, um, I, can, I can share it if you, uh, people don't want to know what a variable is. They want to understand. Uh, they want to feel good about it. They want to understand how things are done, and they want to be able to do stuff, not to feel intimidated by IT people. And it's very important to give them this power to enable them. Yeah, that's what I try to do. But yeah. um, I, I found something very interesting. Uh, so. 
there were quite a, a few successful uh, linked data projects that uh, that uh, I did in the last few years, and and I was wondering, um, what are there any patterns that they show? And recently, I found very interesting patterns. So the, the two most successful projects this year, last year, sorry. Uh, both of them were pilots that were accepted against all resistance and they now are going in production. They have something in common, uh, which is that they do are not initiated neither by the IT departments of these organizations, nor by the core business that which the problems of which they solve. In one of the cases, it was initiated and led by a department for uh, strategic planning. Uh, and in the other case, it was a communication department that uh, had a knowledge management unit, mainly responsible for collaboration, and they they developed interest in, in semantic technologies and linked data, and they triggered something against the resistance, not only of the business people, but their own IT department. And I thought, well, maybe I'm that's a correlation. That's not necessarily something happening. I'm imagining it. This, my, this is my project. And I then checked this for a few other projects in the last five years in these big organizations. And they're really big, like European Commission, 35,000 people. And in fact, it seems that almost always the case. It's not the core business unit that it starts things. It's not the IT, it's somebody else. <laughs> I found only one exception. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so um, what's your impression of the status of these organizations generally when it comes to uh, trying to take advantage of this technology in a practical realm are they making progress with um, projects are they because it seems like there has been a lot of investment over the decade um where do we where do we stand in terms of the european um large public public sector organizations i know it's a it's a broad question well things are not good at all uh, what I can say is that the the lobbies of uh, big IT giants uh, are very strong, and there is one common thing for all public organizations: they they tend to attract risk adverse people, and this kind of path needs to be brave to take risks to. Uh, to take responsibility. What generally is happening is that responsibility is outsourced to two main players, either uh, big research companies, market research companies like Gartner, Forrester and, and so on, or uh, big uh, IT companies. Because if you invite somebody to solve a problem and you ask them have you solved it somewhere else? And they bring you a beautiful list of several hundred references of success stories. There is nothing you can say. They were so successful. And then they, they ask me, uh, I show them something, a nice prototype that can be done almost for free. And they, when I ask, well, was this implemented somewhere else uh, in this way? Can you show us, can you, can you really uh, convince us? Uh, and I'm, well, when I hesitate, they say, well, we are not your guinea pigs. Uh, and in, in that sense, it's extremely difficult. One area uh, where it has been progressing relatively well is the, the linked open data. Because there are a lot of uh, um, regulations and communications uh, about interoperability. So this is sort of supporting such initiatives. But unfortunately, those that publish linked open data, they do not use linked data themselves. So for them, linked data is a cost. So I think that things will be different if they, the system they use daily 
uh, based on these technologies because they will both gain and suffer from them and will make different decisions. That is currently not the case. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's uh, it's difficult and we are in the beginning, at the beginning, uh, which is strange uh, because in terms of investment, if you see EU millions and millions put into into research uh, on these technologies, it's amazing. And not much of that is used back. Yeah, um, when you're talking, I, I, it resonates with me because I was I was in Navy intelligence and, and then on the civilian side, I was uh, overseeing research contracts at Stanford. And, um, you know, it, it, what what I observed inside the agencies I was a part of is exactly what you described. There's there's a tendency to um, contract with the uh, the big incumbents and and the fear that that goes with trying to um, use alternatives and and there's not a lot of it, there's a lot of myopia in in what's chosen and just a lot of inertia in in what ends up being used and so um, you know it's it's a continuing problem not only in the in the European theater obviously um, we're almost to the hour and uh, Mark you've got a question let's yeah, just open up the floor generally yeah, uh, the question I have is that you mentioned the fact that, you know, you looked at this organization and it seemed like the innovation rarely came from the core business itself, which kind of makes sense because if you're the core business, you're so focused on what you're doing that risk taking isn't real high because you have to deliver. But the recipients of your work aren't under that pressure. And so they're a little more free to say, yeah, but this isn't really matching what we need. All right, so I'm kind of summarizing what you said and you're nodding, so I think I probably nailed it there. The question I have is how do you approach finding the right recipients into which you can start to insert this kind of technology and innovation in order to be able to leverage the big rock off of its <laughs> you know, stationary mountain and get it moving again? How do you approach that? Uh, that's a very good question. I think maybe one of the differences uh, in my approach is that I really see the whole thing as as a very complex system. It, I don't see it as an IT problem. Uh, I see everything there as equally important. Uh, politics, emotions, agendas, uh, history, context, all that, uh, it's just uh, boiling all the time and, and changing all the time. So I make sure that I follow it. And what is this find as a successful way of navigating through it, just finding way to have uh, a lot of uh, small fail to, uh, safe to fail uh, experiments until you adapt the whole strategy and try to do that at different speeds. You have certain things that you deliver fast, certain things that you prepare for the next month, certain things that you really focus for the next years, where you need to have different talks with different kind of people that have different perspective. And all that should happen in parallel. Because one of the things that is common for change projects is that they are seen as projects. While we are talking about things that are not projects, on the contrary, Projects are by definition myopic. They they can achieve local optima uh, yeah. at the expense of the enterprise space-wise and, and time-wise. Uh, they could be something very spectacular that they uh, will collect huge debt uh, uh, and then um, it, 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 when it was actually repaid this debt, it, it was forgotten that decision was made a few years back. So mm -hmm. all these things, all these things, all all the waste that happened is very quickly forgotten, and the things that are, are spent only to compensate that are seen as something new, while it could have been saved completely. So would it be safe to say that if <clears throat> you looked across the landscape and surveyed to see who incurs the most um, technical debt? political debt, whatever kind of debt you want to be looking at from the decisions that was made by the core business unit, 
would that maybe be a way to elevate those participants in the ecosystem as ones that would be most receptive to finding a solution because they're carrying most of the debt, the largest part of the debt? Does that seem like a reasonable approach? It is You've identified a pain point. It is difficult for me to generalize and come to any kind of recipes on that. Um, I believe that different people, they do their best uh, from what they know, from their position, from their background, from their perspective, from their mindset. Uh, and it, what, it happens whatever happens. So it's uh, um, there, are, there are commonalities, there are differences, and it's very difficult to come up with something um, uh, as a best practice. Well, it sounds uh, just uh, riffing on what Mark was talking about, Evo. It, it seems like there's another set of metrics that could be developed that just have to do with the, uh, the long-term repercussions of what you adopt. And um, if you're if you're just adopting something that's that's saddling you with complexity, which is what Dave talks about a lot in in Software Wasteland, um, can you can you measure that complexity and and even even staff up to to um, empower those who 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 are measuring the complexity to to say hey we're going in the wrong direction we need to we need to reduce complexity not add to it complexity is not always seen as uh, as bad thing it is labeled as bad same thing but action why is not always seen as bad thing in big organizations. Big organizations, I mean those that always have huge administrations like like telcos, banks and public sector. Because in fact, um, in many cases, these are problems that require solution and the solution requires certain kind of spending, such a kind of new structure that you may be now in not a very good position, but you may start leading it and that would be a good part of your career. So um, I'm not sure that there is a genuine interest to, um, and I'm talking about things are complex anyway. I'm talking about uh, this self-induced complexity that is wasteful. Otherwise, it's it's all social systems are complex. That is a property lesson. That's not a problem to solve. That is something to understand and work with. But of course, we are talking now uh, about this. Um, uh, wasteful complexity that is self-induced, doesn't serve any purpose, and is uh, just pretty artificial b based on um, chain of of bad decisions. Other questions for Evo? Um, Peter's Peter's uh, got his hand up. I'm sorry, so, Peter. Go ahead. For quite some time. Uh, hi, Evo. That was a really interesting uh, set of points that you were making. Um, I sometimes feel that we shoot ourselves in the foot with the vocabulary that we use. So um, many times people like Dave and I are thought of as being cancer specialists, you know, and uh, oncologists. Not, yeah, we're, yeah, exactly. That's right. And the other thing is that um, <clears throat> Uh, when we talk about graphs, everybody thinks of, you know, an X and a Y axis and a line. Now, do you think that, you know, is there anything from your experience that would help us with getting the vocabulary right to get these sorts of things across better? I would again here suggest a, a balanced approach. From one side, there was a lot of, I would say, negative influence from the research and academia, keeping the whole area being perceived as something academic, something not pragmatic, something away from the actual uh, problems of IT. And in that sense, something pure with very uh, specific vocabulary that only certain people can talk. So it's um, it's a, some kind of a bubble. On the other side, uh, there is a few uh, there. There are quite a few attempts to simplify it in a way to bring people 
that they used to mainstream uh, language with it. And I see it in quite a few very nice software packages like um, uh, like predicates uh, appearing with the label of attributes. Uh, and I think that is not necessarily the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to simplify, but it's important to um, simplify towards a different direction, not to, not imitating <laughs> something that that would um, require different um, different kind of mapping. People need to map things with what they know. Uh, for example, in my my, my courses, uh, sometimes it was very funny. So people are sort of um, relatively comfortable with some parts of uh, the ontology development, but most business people find, for example, things like Shackle and uh, Sparkle quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And it's very, it was very interesting to see people with 20 years in IT, sometimes they did the exercises uh, just as quick or slower than business people, because it was difficult to learn SQL when writing Sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> that that gave me a lot of pleasure to see people that knew only you know um, Word and browser <laughs> to write Sparkle queries faster <laughs> than <laughs> SQL people. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, along those lines, it seems like I, I was listening to uh, the radio the other day in the car and um, the National Public Radio, and they 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 uh, one of the reporters who was being interviewed was talking about Slack, and and his observation was that Slack is a nice solution to the wrong problem, and and so you're. Uh, you know, because it, it's 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 just creating more and more ad hocracy, and and you've worked with process a lot in these institutions. What's the path we need to go down to avoid this ad hocracy, and and sort of give us enough structure to actually get things done? Yeah, can you explain a bit more about this ad hocracy to give more examples? I'm I'm using Slack, but I'm not quite sure. What do you mean by that? There's there's a there's a, a chaotic a sort of a random nature to the threads in Slack. Um, there's and and email as well. So we're buried in email now. We're buried in Slack. Can't possibly turn enough tension to just filtering all that stuff to actually get some actionable um, indicators of what to work on and who to work with, etc. And so you you have uh, this this business process management heritage and very highly structured rigid rigid let's say um, environments and then you have what I'd call the ad hocracy which is um, the more chaotic um, and um, and less um, helpful side of things in turn it, it surfaces discussions and you've got all sorts of threads possible but what do you make make how do you make use of it how do you make use of an email thread in a direct way how do you avoid you know getting lost in the morass of of stuff that you don't really need to pay attention to um it, just information overload in other words yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lack of discipline that's involved in ad hocracy. That that word is now part of my vocabulary. Thank you. I like it. <laughs> it's it seems that that's what it is. Is that if there's no discipline involved, which there isn't in social media, the, you know, email, Slack, social media are, all have the same characteristic that anybody can toss anything in anytime they feel like. Whereas a more rigorous approach, a more formal approach that's not so ad hoc gives you more structured capability to review what's there. You know, it's the same difference between a knowledge graph using semantic technology and a labeled property graph, is that you identify a structure in context with the ontology and you don't have that formality in the property graph. 
It's not to say either one is better or worse than the other, but these are different characteristics that carry them forward. So I, I think it's an excellent point. The adhocracy makes it difficult to uh, extract rigor and focus out of it. So I didn't mean to interrupt the response, Evo. I just, that was kind of a clarifying no, point. No, that, that was a very ni nice perspective. My view on that is uh, sort of evolutionary. I, 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 these things adapt like, like just any ecosystem. It would not allow vacuum. And in many cases in the evolution, there are there are different kind of um, adaptation. One of them is exaptation. When something was uh, evolved with one function and it exapted to serve another function, not completely well, but quite fast compared to all the mutation that they needed to develop a completely new organ with to follow this function. That is for the feathers and for many others. And I think this is happening everywhere. Just to um, one example, if you're talking about business uh, uh, process management, it was quite nice for structured processes, but it completely failed for ad hoc discrete processes. And then other things appeared too. Then uh, it started to do certain things around uh, system integration, but not quite well. And things like RPA appeared that are not the most beautiful species, uh, but <laughs> it's sort of, you know, this is. <laughs> exactly, uh, RPA, um, people latched onto it because it seemed simple and and the departments could, could use it uh, in sort of an Excel macro fashion to try to, to um, uh, make themselves more efficient, but it just seems, and Dave calls it a Band-Aid, I agree with that assessment. Um, it's not really solving the deeper problems here. Yeah. Other questions for Evo? We've got uh, 20 minutes left. Sebastian, you've, you've had, um, exposure to some of these things in your in your career as well. I'm just wondering if you had any comments or observations that are relevant here. Um, <clears throat> hi, Alan. Thank you. Hi. Um, so uh, thanks for putting the word uh, adhocracy to my vocabulary. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, I, 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 was struggling a long time with the linked open data portal at the EU. It uh, was pretty complicated to get, you know, to to the data and everything. And uh, thanks, Ivo, for sharing the insight. I think um, it, it fits to the picture that people are not leveraging um, linked data uh, on a productive uh, level themselves, but they see it as a publishing and a, as a cost factor. And I think that's something that um, reflects in, 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 the, in, the, in the publishing uh, uh, platform of the EU. I mean, it, it come along, has come a long way. Uh, and, but yeah, I, I was struggling with that quite a lot. Like, uh, how do you get the ontologies that are actually uh, have been made there? I see that there's a lot of data sets here, uh, but it's really hard to 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 get to the uh, to the to the uh, interesting stuff. So um, maybe Evo, you have some uh, um, uh, yeah comments or um, suggestions on this. Well. Uh... <laughs> Uh, that's a very good topic, and I can and I talk a lot about it. Uh, but I can <laughs> only one thing, only one thing that um, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on, on on metadata. So you can find huge amount of uh, data sets described with with DCAD, mm -hmm. and you stop there. Yes, I mean it, it's like it's, it's like it's like you enter a wine shop and you are allowed to see the labels, but you cannot drink anything. So this kind of approach could not really make things being valued, being used, being demanded, and being improved. 
Mm -hmm. So um, that is something which, uh, but the same the, the the same kind the same organization from in the in the from the institutions is publishing something else, uh, which is the whole European legislation as linked data, and that is extremely useful. Wow! You can find everything on any language. Uh, it's it's uh, it's a very successful thing, which is now growing because they, they would like to increase the granularity to go to the lower and lower level uh, inside the documents uh, that would give to this level also their URIs and link them with other things. So it, that, that part is, uh, I think, um, a, a successful case, not uh, uh, so much advertised as the other that you mentioned, um, but uh, for me, uh, it's much more valuable. Mm -hmm. Could you possibly share a link to that? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, that'd be that'd be super amazing. useful. It's good to know where the success stories are buried. Yeah, but it, it's not advertised. I don't think even it has a decent um, UI. I can share uh, the things that I just query, which is just an sparkle endpoint <laughs> so um yeah it, it's not so much advertised but it's it's used a lot and it's it's critical uh, for many users uh, because i don't know if you if if you have other cases where the whole legislation uh, of uh, such a big organization which is the european union is uh, is available as linked data it's it's quite an amazing uh, achievement mm -hmm. yeah don't don't worry we all speak sparkle so you're in good company here <laughs> no i don't mean that uh, i mean that uh for example if you just see the ontology and a few other things because it uses a lot, a lot of name graphs and whatever it would be uh faster to go through that uh but um, <coughs> I, I i don't think such maybe it's available somewhere i don't know yeah, let me check. Um, yeah, I found something. Luckily, I find things quickly in my in my personal knowledge graph. So I found the ontology. Yeah, it will appear as MD. Sorry for that, but this is the quickest way to share it. No, uh, it didn't appear as a. So no, something happened. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Um, I think. Yeah, but whilst you're looking, Ifo, I mean, there are a number of countries within the EU that are beginning to get their legislative assets into order. I mean, for quite a long time, the legislation.gov.uk has had uh, linked data uh, IRIs for every part and every variation of legislation, but it's a bit slow to get up to date. And that's only slowly kind of improving. But Switzerland are getting together IRIs for the legislation. Uh, Luxembourg, the Grand Duché, has been doing similar sorts of things for, for quite a time. What, what I feel is missing is that, uh, and I'd be interested in your, your kind of views on this, is that people are coming to these sort of things very late in life, and yet we learn about the information model of RDF when we're about five, six, or seven, something like that, where we have to pass sentences, the cat sat on the mat, we understand subject, predicate, object, and then we have this gap of maybe about 15 to 20 years before we then start to meet it again in RDF form. And I'm wondering if this is... 15 to 20 years of huge missed opportunity and that what we should be addressing is kind of like the 10 year old. And that I think now has got a lot of really good material for them to begin to start using both from Wikidata, from DBpedia, and from things like the legislation stuff such that they can bring that into their schoolwork throughout high school. I, I'm working with a lot of, uh, with a few, not a lot of, but a few people that are quite into uh, into machine learning and NLP, doing impressive stuff with uh, transformers. 
and and I, and I think see things that are quite difficult to do with, with RDF. So um, I believe to to really trust more. There are a lot of because when you translate things into RDF, they look a bit too formal, too clumsy. So, uh, and that's why all this tendency to use it only for metadata management. So once we find a way to um, bring these two worlds together, the, these new approaches of working uh, with natural text and finding affiliations so in, in, different, in different ways, which, by the way, worked very nice with uh, graphs, but most developers prefer LPGs for them because it's much more easier to do analytics there, to create all these weights that I needed and so on. Um, I think then it will be um, better for, for people because they would, they would not really care so much about these things. They would just naturally use them. Uh, they would appreciate how nice it is for entities and entity types to have a persistent URI and to be linked with things that also have persistent URIs, but also they need to find a way that these things are discoverable when emergent from new texts and from things that people naturally create. You would not start writing your, uh, your message, your email in RDF. You just type it in your natural language, and that should be, that should be uh, um, not just a matter uh, you do it and there are <coughs> easy way to to annotate it that's not enough uh, we need much more innovation this in this area to 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 make it to make it natural to make it because now there are huge opportunities that these people using lpgs for machine learning are missing out because of not using rdf and, and also i see the opposite yeah it's the tribalism that we talked about before, and and when the the uh, linked open data community or the semantics community um, uh, makes a suggestion or tries to incentivize good behavior, it's it's the tail wagging the dog. We just don't have a critical mass of um, of um, influence to to really have an impact on the larger developer community, for example, and, um, you know, certainly the business analysts who are, you know, likely to, to, to need what we have and, and, and need to learn how to use it. Um, other questions while in the time remaining? This has been a really good discussion. Uh, yeah, so I was very intrigued by your, Evo, your two-day training, for, mostly aimed at business people. Is there an agenda or any kind of materials that that you can have a look? I mean, I, I want to emulate that. Mm, because they were developed uh, in the contract with the European Commission, they are intellectual property of the European Commission. And um, although I'm the author, uh, I, I was paid to develop that to be provided inside the, 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 the institutions. So I need to check uh, how I can I can share it. Yeah, it's not absolutely. it's not something yeah. um, very special, um, but um, still it's sort of you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Anyway, it's um, I'm so heavily recommending your two books that everybody thinks I'm your agent. <laughs> 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 I, I have the same feeling. Yeah, it's a, it it's um it Thank it you. really is has been um, illuminating for people to to read those books. Um, it makes a great Father's Day gift. <laughs> <laughs> Other things we should be talking about, Eva. What what haven't we asked about that we should be? Uh, well, uh, I don't know. It's mm, what I can say that uh, the data centric 
mindset is uh, yet not there. And right. when it appears here and there is more of a lip service. Yep. There is a lot of talk in very nice documents supporting these ideas. So if people really follow them, they from all perspectives, economical and ethical, uh, uh, something to to go after. But the situation is quite different. There is a huge vendor lock in. There is um, a lot of, um, you know, I, I don't see big changes in in the next few years, but it, 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 there is there is there is some change that that happened in the last few years. Um, before it was really marginal. Now people talk about it. They take it into account. They started to compare it. Uh, they I saw quite a few people from the institutions going in and, and signing the Cetetic Manifesto. Uh, this is quite, quite new. And because people became more aware of how things go and when they fail and they start to remember that things could have been decided otherwise. Mm -hmm. So there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So a question yeah. that your comments prompts to me is there are barriers to entry out there. It's not moving as quickly as anybody uh, who's drank the Kool-Aid and is selling Dave's books for him <laughs> believes. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, are there barriers to entry that you see out there that you have some insight into how to climb over them? effectively within the organizations. There's all kinds of barriers from, you know, resistance to change and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just curious if you have insight into any particular um, barriers that you see paired with uh, an approach to climb over them. Certain people are in a strong position because of their past. So when they see something like this happening, they know that they're not going to own it and manage it. Mm -hmm. Their power will be diminished by somebody who can do such thing. That's why they have additional resistance, even when they're intellectually convinced that might be a better approach. Right. A and that's, that's quite a common barrier that I think I see. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I think Upton Sinclair put it well when he said it's hard to convince somebody of a new idea when their salary depends on their not understanding it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite so. Yeah. Well, uh, incentivizing the right behavior, um, it's... Uh, it's just a continuing challenge. And, and um, is there an upbeat note, <laughs> Mark or, or Evo, that you'd like to make on what, you know, what I was thinking, Evo, was that there's an 80-20 dynamic that we've observed in enterprise over the years, the 20% being the innovators. And so when I try to tell stories about how we've succeeded um, I look for, I look to the 20 percent and um, I find the people who are behind the the success stories and I tell those and uh, there's always the caveat that that most organizations don't aren't even thinking about these things um, does that sound right to you that that um, we have to look to the innovators and and um, what else can we do to to sort of move this forward in a bigger way? Uh, there's a lot that could be done from the the semantic community. I think um, the, the there, there are huge gaps that led to all these things being being still marginal. I think uh, we should do much more to attract developers, listen to their needs, do things that is natural for them. You saw uh, GraphQL achieve popularity in two years that Sparkle didn't achieve in uh, 15. 
although it's it's much weaker language, then we have to really collect and share successful case studies. That is super convincing when you, when you show something. We have to make it easier for end users. Uh, and it's very important to attract people from the business. Data is way too important to be left to IT people. <laughs> that's well said. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so that's the task ahead of us. Um, great conversation, everybody. Evo, thanks for all the stimulating discussion and thanks for taking the time. Peter, thanks for in introducing us to Evo. Uh, you're welcome anytime, sir. And uh, we'll look forward to reading more from you and uh, further discussions then. Thanks a lot for having me. Evo, Evo, great to meet you. And your commission check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You still have my address, right? Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Great conversation. Thank you yeah. very much, Evo. That Thank was you, everybody. Really wonderful. Yeah, and great I talk must say, Evo's book is really interesting. I would recommend that. Oh, thanks. You also have the commission. Great. Yes. Okay. Good, good exchange of money this evening. Great. <laughs>